Hey, Matt, how's it going? Hey, George, how are things with you? Good, except I can hear my own audio coming back. Was that your audio or my audio that I was? None of the above. I'm not sure what that was. Okay, well, either way, nice to see you here. Um, I guess it's been a little while. It looks like we have all kinds of people in the chat here. Uh, Sorry, guys, just bear with us while we're trying to sort this out here. Sounds like we're getting doubling up on audio, hearing it once yeah, and then hearing it again. I think it's good now. In any case, we've got a few minutes here. We'll let everybody collect, uh, gather, and uh, sign into the Crowdcast page and uh, let us know where you're from. It's nice to know where people are watching all this content from. We see people from Algeria, from San Diego, from Michigan, from Belgium, uh, mm -hmm. all over the world. People are looking for solutions on how to uh, set up encoding, whether it's software or hardware. So we're going to dig into that today. Yeah. And uh, throughout this webinar, we'll have uh, some polls that'll be going up. As an example, we have uh, a poll that's currently up right now asking you, what role do you play within the education market? Um, so we'd love to get your feedback uh, as you guys are going throughout this presentation. Just keep an eye out for that notification in the bottom there. If you guys have questions that you do want to ask the president throughout that webinar and the presentation, please throw them in the Q&A section. Um, you can throw them in the comments, but they risk getting lost. So if you can, and also encourage the other people watching to throw them in the Q&A section, you can always vote them up so that they get higher priority if they're more popular questions. So Matt, while we wait for everybody to join up here, um, tell us your experience. You, you're our education expert. How did you become so qualified to talk about uh, education and encoding together? Well, a lot of it has to do with the fact that, I mean, first and foremost, we're in a market that deals with video encoding on a daily basis. Um, and probably the fact that we have so much experience and that I speak to so many um, experts and faculty members and professionals within the education industry, um, I've been able to get numerous amounts of feedback about what are some pain points and some successes of video encoding and uh, lecture capture within a virtual environment. So uh, we can definitely go over some of those pain points as well as some of those successes throughout this webinar. Um, but and then just looking at what would be simplest to most effective solutions that you can possibly get. Nice. So what about you, George? What's, uh, what's your experience with being this whole pandemic virtual experience really and we're moving on to on, moving online for streaming and for uh webinars well so like a lot of the people who i'm sure are watching today who are trying to find a way to quickly get online either get their faculty online if they're an it administrator or maybe they themselves are a teacher uh looking to find ways to connect with their students uh, we're doing the same thing, but from a business point of view. So uh, mm -hmm. we're conducting webinars on a regular basis and we're live streaming all the time. And all of these rely critically on encoding. Uh, so uh, we have a lot of different experiments happening right now with different kinds of hardware encoding as well as software encoding. So hopefully we can provide a bit of value today uh, to people who are not sure which way to go on. So Matt, what do we run through the, what are we going to cover today? Let's, let's, let's pop into our agenda and talk, give everybody the rundown. Right. So I guess first and foremost, let's talk a little bit about the fact that flipped classrooms are, are becoming more and more relevant and popular right now within these current digitally enhanced times. Um, and some of this will be looking at it from a recorded uh, perspective and even from a live classroom perspective. Right. So faculty members, teachers, content providers need to know um, how to record video. And oh, sometimes and some they're recording a lot more or a lot less than they used to be. And so we'll have to run through those questions as to how you want to capture that content into either a computer or a dedicated device, uh, looking at options for streaming and how to record that content effectively as well. So let's talk a little bit about what in video encoding is. By doing that, so video encoding, first and foremost, is a way of being able to capture uh, your video and audio content and displaying it in a means so that your audience can watch it and consume it. Over today's, over today's webinar, we are going to be going over a few things, um, such as looking at the difference as software encoding, what are some of the benefits, some of the limitations, um, where it might be most prevalent, 
and uh, as well as where there might be a little bit of a difference when comparing that to a hardware encoding standpoint. Looking at some of those uh, benefits, some of those limitations as well, and uh, how those situations might differ a little bit. And lastly, we're also going to double check looking at which one would best benefit your specific situation, either in a short term or in a long term. And again, if you guys have any questions throughout this presentation, please do not hesitate to let us know. Yeah, Drop your question in the Q&A section. Sorry, George, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Yeah, our goal is to help you figure out what you need for your scenario. So uh, we can, it's okay. We can spend as much time as we need to on questions at the end. So if you have specific questions about your school or, or, or anything to do with uh, software or hardware encoding, please do our best. So I guess we should get started and talk about um, hardware and software encoding primer, right? Right. So what is a video uh, encoder? So mentioning that very briefly before, uh, a you video encoder. <laughs> Sorry, George, I'm running into a couple of technical glitches here where I'm getting a lot of delay. So I do apologize if there's any issues there. Uh, video encoding from a standpoint is being able to take your video source. So either it's the output from a laptop or your video camera, uh, and you're inputting that into your computer or into a specific dedicated device. So it basically just takes that video content uh, with or without audio and then converts it into a means to being able to consume it or to watch it or to uh, provide it to someone. So either sending it to a streaming platform um, or just as recorded content that can be uploaded as later date. So, when looking at encoders, there's two main major different sections. There's a software option, which is where you're primarily leaning on your computer to do most of that encoding. Uh, and then there's hardware options, which are dedicated devices that have been purpose built to get that content for video and audio recording and pushing that out to the internet for streaming or pushing it up to maybe a platform like a content management system. So let's talk a little bit about the software encoding side. So from a software encoding side, um, where you'll typically see this is you'll have something like a, a video capture card to capture the output of a computer, or sorry, of a camera, and then you'll input that into your computer using USB. Um, typically, you might be using an external audio source or maybe a USB audio source to also mirror that or mix that in together. And maybe you'll use slides that are also from that same computer or from a different computer that you're trying to input into that specific software. Ultimately, your goal is to add that to a either content management platform or to uh, you know, any sort of end destination platform. So whether that's streaming to YouTube or streaming to somewhere like Kaltura or Panopto. There's also education specific software. So as an example, um, Panopto, has uh, what's known as the Panopto Recorder or Lecture Capture Live, and Kaltura has a Capture Space Recorder. Uh, there's also company-specific uh, purpose-built software applications such as TechSmith, uh, so Camtasia and Snagit. Uh, those are relatively inexpensive or cheap, uh, even, sorry, not cheap, uh, free applications that allow you to capture video and audio sources to be used uh, within a streaming environment. That being said, our most popular known uh, software application ones are typically the most inexpensive, like OBS Studio or OBS software. Uh, and then we do have some more broadcast specific software encoders like Wirecast and vMix. Uh, if you guys are curious to check some of those out, you're more than welcome to. Wirecast does have a free version, but it is primarily used in a paid platform with a significant other features. So. How is software encoding better in your everyday use? Well, it's easy to get started. Everybody out there has a computer, or almost everyone should. So it makes it really easy to access, right? You can either pay for or download or access free or net or browser-based software encoders. Um, and they're typically usually affordable. So if you're using something like OBS, uh, it's free. And there's also platform specific, uh, like Kaltura and Panopto that would be included within the content management system suites. They're also pretty easy to operate. Um, a lot of purpose built software encoders are entirely focused around having that user experience. So they try to make it as straightforward as humanly possible to get from point A 
to point Z, sorry, American friends, it is Z here, um, to be able to provide that content to your end destination. So whether that's for a student or for a general audience. There are a few limitations to consider with that though, right? Um, advanced setups require additional equipment. So this means maybe you start off with a USB webcam or an external camera and maybe a USB microphone, but as your needs start to develop and change, maybe you wanna make it more dynamic, maybe you need to add a document camera. Uh, with each additional piece of equipment that you need to add, you're adding a layer of complexity. When you add that complexity, it starts to get a little bit more challenging for something like a technical support or an IT team to manage as well, right? Uh, there's cables to consider, device failure to consider, possible compatibility issues. So just to think that over time, you may want to think of another way of being able to capture those multiple video sources. There's also a high dependency on that host computer that's hosting all of that software. Maybe in the beginning, you had just your one video camera source, uh, and your audio source, but as you're trying to add a different USB capture card, maybe your computer isn't quite as powerful as you thought it might be, and you might need to do an update. As soon as you have to start changing computers, you start running into additional challenges. So being mindful that there are some limitations with software is hugely important. And finally, depending on the software application that you're using, you could also run into challenges such as technical dependency. If you're not the most tech savvy person in the world, if you're uh, more limited information, if you have more limited knowledge or information when it comes to software and technology, it might be a little bit steeper of a learning curve to understand uh, the world of live streaming through software and coding. So there's definitely some things to keep in mind there. Now, how does that compare to something like a hardware encoder? Hardware encoders are very, very different. These are appliances or devices that are purpose-built for that sole purpose of recording, streaming, and maybe live switching. These devices have been designed from the ground up to simply capture all of that video and audio content, put that into a format that is easily understood and transferable, and to push that into its end destination, either for a recording or for a live stream. Because these devices are purpose-built, all the components and pieces have been hand-picked. This means that the technology has been heavily considered looking at the best purpose, uh, you know, memory, CPU, pieces of component, and this will allow you ultimately to have reliability for years to come without worrying about failure or compatibility. Most hardware encoders or dedicated hardware encoders um, often usually have more inputs. So when you compare that to software encoding, where you have to have multiple separate pieces, a hardware encoder will typically have something like HDMI, SDI, USB, and even support for analog audio. So you don't have to worry about getting a USB audio interface. Here's how it would work essentially. You take those maybe two, three video sources. So in this case, maybe two cameras and a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, your analog audio, you connect them directly to your hardware encoder, and then you direct it either as a live stream or as recorded plat or recorded content that will automatically upload to that specific platform. So in this case, we're looking at content management systems, something maybe like Panopto or Kaltura. There are also other avenues as well. Um, maybe a content management system isn't currently in your deck of cards. Maybe you're an educational institution that only has a learning management system. Well, there are features out there with standalone hardware encoders allow you to automatically upload that content to a separate platform, either through network sharing or network storage. Hardware encoders, on top of having uh, additional features, they also have better performance because they're designed specifically in mind with that purpose. You never have to worry about them getting overworked slowing down or even crashing. As these devices have been built with that purpose, it makes them so much easier to use. And they're also very flexible in how you want to use them. So you can think of them as using them for lecture capture, but you could also use them for live event production. You could use them within a legal environment. Maybe you could use them in the healthcare industry. You could use them for corporate video marketing. They can be repurposed for uh, student use within different classroom environments or workshops. So. The limitations are really up to your imagination at that point. 
they're also very, very highly reliable because of all of these different options and that flexibility that's available. The other thing, of course, with hardware encoders is that it's very simple to use and manage once they've been installed. Typically, you're not going to be the person who's doing the installation on site. It'll usually be an IT or a network infrastructure individual doing that. They can connect this hardware encoder directly into your environment, configure it as necessary, and then you as a faculty member or a student just has to simply come in, maybe log in, or just even hit start and you're ready to go. It also makes it a very affordable way long term to be able to provide professional grade content without hesitation, without delay. And if you've got something like just a simple start stop button, super easy to use. If you've got systems in place with a content management system, you even have the ability to sometimes schedule and automatically trigger those specific events at the appointed time, making a completely hands free solution. There are a few limitations and drawbacks, though. Because of its purpose built design, it also necessarily means it also sometimes necessarily means that you won't get all of those features you might want. One device might have chroma keying while the other one has NDI support. One of them might not have transition options and will have hard cuts while the other one will. But when you have those transition options, maybe you don't have those NDI sources or, or options that you necessarily need. So while there's a couple of trade-offs, they're usually much smaller in terms of limitation when you compare them to the benefit. And there's always workarounds to get there. The other thing, of course, is that it is more cost upfront. Where you compare it to a software encoder where you might be having free software to start and maybe spending a little bit of money on USB capture cards, as that complexity starts to rise, so do your cost. And little by little over time becomes a lot, not only in cost, but in complexity, troubleshooting, and compatibility. So all-in-one electric capture devices are probably going to be your best bang for buck long term. Perl 2 and Perl Mini are a prime example of that. We have the ability to record and stream in high quality simultaneously for that recording or streaming. And you can also do things like multi-streaming. You can stream to multiple destinations simultaneously. So you could stream to your content management system. You could stream to Facebook. You could stream to YouTube. Anywhere that can support a standard RTMP or RTMPS stream, as an example, will be able to do that. And of course, having the ability to mix multiple video and audio sources, create custom layouts for that live switching experience if you want that full production value. Now, no one says that you have to be the one doing all of this. You could always have a producer on hand to help you with that. As a reliable hardware encoder, you also have those multiple video and audio inputs. HDMI, on SDI, Sorry, Matt. and XLR. <laughs> Sorry about you. Uh, speaking of uh, having a producer on hand, uh, hey. I was waiting for a good moment to segue. You're totally on a roll there. Um, folks, if you didn't notice, we were having some technical issues with Zoom. Uh, my name is Cameron. I'm just producing all of this in the back end here. So we are going to just take a quick two to three minute break. We're going to close our Zoom account. We're going to relaunch it. We're going to come right back to the webinar, right where Matt left off talking about uh, Pearl 2 and Pearl Mini. I do apologize about the inconvenience. We're just having some local uh, internet service provider issues with George. He was our co-host that you saw talking earlier. So if you could please just bear with us. Don't go anywhere. Do not go over to the SpaceX uh, live feed that you've been flipping back and forth from. Uh, we will be back in just, uh, say, two to three minutes. So please stand by and uh, don't change that dial. Hey, we're back, Matt. Sorry, Hello. that that entire outage was my uh, poor home internet uh, service. So. You know what? That, that comes with the territory, and we say it time and time again. If you guys are planning on doing live stream, you need to make sure you have the upload bandwidth available. Um, that's why we always recommend doubling up on your bandwidth. Even if you only need five megabits per second, try to have 10 because you never know when there's a fluctuation. Yes, and lock your family in a room with no internet. I think that's another good lesson. That tends to help, yeah. Um, well, it's nice to have you back. Thank you. you were, I was watching, you were, you were doing a, a marvelous job. So mm -hmm. I suggest you carry on uh, from uh, where you left off. I'm going to look at the questions that we have up on Crowdcast, and I'll look at these polls up here as well, and uh, I'll interrupt in a few minutes and we can talk about those. 
Sure. So before I quickly jump back into this, uh, just a reminder, guys, if you do have questions, throw them in the Q&A section. Try to avoid throwing them in the comments because they can get missed. And uh, as well, just keep an eye out for polls uh, and notifications there. So uh, I'll take a quick spin back one slide there just to say again. So if we're looking at all-in-one capture solutions, the ability to record and stream in high quality, uh, the ability to stream and record simultaneously and stream to multiple destinations simultaneously. In short, you know, YouTube, Facebook, content management systems, you name it, you have it. Uh, there's just no ends to the possibilities of hardware encoders, which also offer the added benefit of being able to connect multiple video and audio sources, right? Whether that's HDMI, SDI, analog audio inputs like XLR, uh, even USB-based video and audio sources such as a USB webcam or a USB audio source like uh, a Blue Yeti, Blue Yeti microphone, uh, or any other brand of USB microphone, as long as these devices don't need drivers installed on them. That would be the only limitation. It's also really easy to do fleet management. So being able to control and support multiple devices over the same network. So those are some added benefits of having a standalone hardware encoder. And finally, of course, I did talk about the easy use of a single start stop button. Uh, features like our one touch solution on the Pearl family of products are more than capable of simplifying a very professional setup. So Matt, um, this next section we're gonna be talking about how to really choose. We've given you the nuts and bolts of why you might choose one or the other, mm -hmm. but a lot of it depends on who you are. And if you look at our first poll, the question was, uh, who are you basically? And we're seeing that most of the people here are watching are IT and tech support people. Mm -hmm. So most people are going to have a very different opinion of, of what qualifies uh, a solution for them. So please let us know in the comments what you think uh, of hardware versus software and coding here. Uh, you know, we're biased in one sense because uh, we sell a lot of hardware and coding products, but we also sell capture cards that enable software and coding. So we'd love to know your uh, feedback on that. Um, some of the other polls we ran, we asked you, uh, if your school uses virtual classes, if they're live or if they're supplemented by video lectures, um, people are saying yes. So it looks like the people are doing all kinds of different sort of uh, video delivery methods. Yeah, and, uh, and the question is also like, you know, are you spending more time doing streaming or are you spending more time doing recording? When I've been talking back and forth with a lot of different educational institutions, it seems to be a pretty even split between I like doing this live or I like recording it. Mm -hmm. And my kids, they're in primary school, but what I'm seeing now is they started off, everything was very simple. They did VOD recorded videos only. Mm -hmm. And I guess as they got comfortable with that, they started bridging into more live sessions where as their comfort level went up. So uh, it's probably other people are transitioning into more and more live content because as you know, and, and we know here at FFN, the more, when you do live content, it's a wonderful thing because when it's done, it is done and you don't have any work to do. So that's a really nice feeling at the end of a live broadcast. Yeah. But... If you're in a situation where you might have limited network bandwidth um, <laughs> or you run into hiccups, maybe a VOD or recorded event is the uh, safer way to go. It also gives you an option to be able to do multiple takes if you run into any sort of hiccups or issues. So there is kind of some benefits to both. Uh, for sure, for sure, for sure. Um, what else have we got in these polls? Just your score. Oh, yeah, you've got that poll. Um, is your encoding, is encoding software or hardware deployed at your school? Uh, it's quite a mix here. Uh, mm -hmm. Not too many votes on it either, but more people are using software encoders than hardware encoders, but only by one vote. Um, right. Well, we do we do absolutely encourage you guys to do uh, vote in the polls. I mean, it's not mandatory, but we just get a better understanding of uh, kind of where your educational institutions are at, what your needs might be. Uh, it also just helps us target how what kind of webinars you guys might like to see in the future as well. So should we jump into the bottom line, Matt, and, and talk about why you choose one over the other? Yeah. So, like, I mean, what would be the best reason you would probably want to choose, like, a software encoder, George? If your setup is simple, I would say a couple of things. If you have a fairly simple setup, like I'm doing today here, but where I have a single camera and I'm doing a screen share along with it with a computer. Actually, you are today, but often I'm just doing a screen sure. share and a, a camera feed and a microphone feed. Yeah. And I'm also a technical person. So I don't mind spending the time to try to figure out how to get all of my settings working properly. 
So for my, in my case, a capture card uh, with software streaming is perfectly well suited. Right. But what, I, but what I see is a lot of people who have a little bit of trepidation about technology, that's where this system kind of falls down. And you get those calls all the time, I'm sure. It's true. But uh, I think some of the biggest uses for software encoding uh, are typically what, you know, uh, Mike Rich has previously mentioned in a, in a previous webinar that we've done talking about like an initial wave, right? It's the best way to get started with live streaming, with being able to do at home virtual content. But as your needs start to evolve, similar as like your daughter's schooling, you might need to up that that set up a little bit, that production value, and things will start to change. So software encoding might not be the long-term solution, but it's a great start. Yeah, and it depends how risk-averse you are as well. If, if you're in a situation where you work for a, maybe you were at a private uh, school where people pay a lot of money to that to that uh, institution and they expect spectacular results. I'm not saying they don't expect, expect good results in the public school system, but uh, sometimes there's a little higher pressure. Uh, when you're in a private institution. And in that case, maybe you don't want to take any risk at all. And you can try to solve that problem by investing a little bit more in hardware encoding as well. Absolutely. So how familiar you are with using encoding software? Is this something that you've typically used for electric capture purposes? Or is this something that you're pretty well brand new to? New poll is up. Please feel free to answer it when you get a chance. So why would you want to choose a hardware solution? Well, I've already gone through a lot of the ins and outs of what are the benefits are, but when it comes down to it, the more advanced or complicated your setup might be, uh, asking and, and needing multiple video and audio sources, especially if it's analog audio, uh, hardware encoders might be the better fit. Ultimately, it'll also simplify your life, right? As a teacher, even as an IT staff professional, as most of you guys might be here uh, today, Having to set it up once and kind of set it and forget it is kind of nice. If you're doing something with direct integration with a content management system, you can predefine an entire schedule or calendar, upload it to the device, and then it's completely hands-free. Maybe the odd occasional administrative needs, but for the most part, it'll keep your life pretty simple. And it's great just as a bulletproof solution, right? Even if you want to set up a dedicated room or space. Um, I believe Thomas Moore was an example of that. That's right. Uh, so Thomas Moore is a school in Belgium, and they are a, 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 big customer of our, a big customer of ours. They own many different Pro Mini systems, and they deploy them throughout their 14 campuses. And the reason they value them is because they have, uh, they're trying to limit any technical uh, ability of their teachers. So when a teacher goes into the room, they say, if there's two things to do, there's a good chance one of them, they might not understand how to do it. So if they can put something in a room where it's a one button, just push the button and make it work, mm -hmm. that's what they're looking for. So that's ultimately why they came to our system. Uh, and they wanted something that was all in one and not a complex uh, nature of a lot of different equipment that had to many failure points. So. Right. So let's maybe explore some of those questions. I'm sure some of you guys have some, and hopefully it's not just, hey, what happened to George? Where did he go? I understand that question. It was a good one. Uh, but uh, run me through. let's run through some of those questions. Sure, sure. So we've got one right away where someone's asking a question that you'll know pretty well, Matt, is, uh, is Pearl Mini designed to be running 24-7, or is it recommended to be shut down after streaming? You can definitely run it for 24-7, uh, 365 days a year. However, we do recommend occasionally, maybe if you can, once a month, at least rebooting the unit. Um, you know, Depending on how complex your configuration is, if you're constantly changing configuration presets on the unit, sometimes little glitches could occur over time or little hiccups. And so just doing an occasional reboot, just as it's important for any of your hardware devices, like a computer or a phone, doing it with a hardware appliance is not a bad way of going. Uh, and if you're doing something like a firmware update, the unit is going to reboot anyways. So the occasional reboot is beneficial for your device, but it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, I'm with you on that. I've seen them run for 24 seven in many applications. We have a lot of customers using them for security thing, uh, applications and things where they are expected to just run all the time. So yeah, uh, and to give it. you guys an idea, because we're not at the offices, we're all working remote. Um, even this, the units that we have in technical support have been running without having been reboot since probably the beginning of March at this point. So uh, they can definitely run long term without being rebooted. But we're learning that. Yeah. Uh, next question. Uh, any idea if Perl 2 will be able to stream to Zoom anytime soon? Um, 
I know I we're mean, in talk too about this. We're trying to get a, uh, a way to make that as streamlined as possible, but it's not going to be happening. There's no good development happening today on this. You're not going to see any firmware update coming out in the next month or two. Uh, of course, we're going to try and do something beyond that, but we'll see. But Matt, we use Zoom right now for this. Yes. So maybe can you give them a little uh, yeah. overview of how we're using Zoom? Sure. So uh, in short, the reason that we can't currently use it with Zoom is just because uh, the, the supporter compatibility isn't there. Um, some platforms are more focused on integration through direct connection to devices or through software, uh, while something like Perl Family is, is a standalone device that doesn't necessarily directly interact with software. The way that we've managed to leverage our Perl Family of products uh, within Zoom is by using our USB capture cards. So you would capture the HDMI output of a Perl Mini or a Perl 2 into a USB capture card, which is then being leveraged as a video source uh, within Zoom. So it's the ability to be able to capture all that content to your computer. And ultimately, the, the AVIO is kind of recognized as a webcam within Zoom. Now, we have a little bit of back and forth that takes place as well. Um, so it's a little bit more complicated of, of a configuration than at first glance. Uh, but we do have previous webinars where we've gone through. Actually, it's a webinar that you and I did, George, where we actually broke down a little bit uh, of how that was done. Yeah, we went into even greater detail on our uses of Zoom uh, with Pearl 2. Uh, if you visit our YouTube channel, uh, where yeah. we stream live every Thursday at 3 p.m., we do shows about live video production. And, and Cameron and I did one, where Cameron's our producer for this, where he did a detailed analysis of how he's using Zoom and Pearl 2 together. So if you have curiosity, uh, visit our YouTube channel and look for that video. It was a couple of weeks ago. So it should be easy to find. Absolutely. Um, how to get IT buy-in. James Ryan is asking this. Now, I'm not exactly sure what, I, I could probably use a little more context here, James, if, if you're still around. Um, mm. But well, let me ask you this, Matt, to frame it. How to get IT buy-in for a Perl system. Uh, you want to take a stab at that? I'm wondering if more it's it's I'm wondering if the question might be how to get an IT team or maybe the upper management team to get interested in investing into these specific products. Um, and ultimately, it's all about how you frame the technology. As long as you can frame it as a as a benefit or as an asset that will give somebody back more time, um, it's far more likely that you'll get the answer that you need. I'm sorry, I don't understand more of uh, enough of the context of the question to. Yeah, yeah, I think you touched on, on a pretty key point though. If you're you can make a case that this will save time for for you as an IT person or save time for your professors and everybody else involved that's going to be a pretty compelling argument we hear about IT departments talking about the need for devices that uh, are going to be secure on their network and maybe it's not today that your network security is is really strict but inevitably there's going to be more security coming to your organization that's just the way the world is, is, is coming and so on our Perl systems there's quite a bit of uh, security features there that, that help IT people. So that, that's maybe one compelling reason to, to use a hardware encoder as opposed to a, a bunch of Windows computers uh, throughout your system, but. Yep, there's a lot of, uh, software encoders require a lot of constant uh, configuration, whereas a hardware encoder, if it's got those integration features with something like a content management system, maybe occasionally once a month, you might have to do some sort of update from the content management side just to adjust the schedule, but that's it. It's not a daily, I have to add a stream key, I have to configure my specific settings and then go. So it's right. time, time is money in my opinion and a hardware encoder will save you a lot of time. For sure. Uh, here's another one for you, Matt. Uh, you have NDI inputs on Perl 2. We do. How about NDI out? It does exist on Perl 2 actually. Um, if you're a, a Perl 2 user already, as an example, when you create a channel, which you can think of as an independent encoder, uh, you can navigate to this stream page. And as one of the streaming protocol options, you have NDI out. And if you have an application that supports NDI, um, you can take the stream output from Perl and capture it into that specific software if, if need be. So if you're using something like Microsoft Teams or vMix, I'm trying to think of other software applications that would be able to capture an NDI source. Needless to say, there's definitely some options for both NDI input and output with the Perl 2. Awesome, thank you. Um, here's another one for you, uh, being our tech support expert here today. Sure. Can you configure one of Perl 2's USB as a webcam output so another computer can recognize it 
with other collaboration software? That's Unfortunately, no. Um, the USB ports on our Pearl family products are used either in for three possibilities. It can be a USB input for video. It can be a USB input for audio. So as long as it's a UVC or a UAC standard, meaning there's no drivers to install, uh, it can also be used as USB storage to either copy or move recorded content off of the Pearl family's internal storage. Right. So at the moment, unfortunately, no USB out. So I guess this person saw would, you'd have to have a capture card saw and you'd output through the HDMI out of your Pearl 2 and using that capture card, another computer would recognize that as a USB video signal. So there's Absolutely. a way to do what you're doing. It just requires another small piece of hardware. <laughs> Here's a random question from, from Brecht. Um, how is support organized in Europe? So you must get calls from European customers. customers. Mm -hmm. What happens? How do we help our European friends? Sure. So uh, we do have uh, quite a few. So basically our support team is based almost entirely in, in North America. Um, and we do have a little bit of staggering of shifts to try and support that. But there's also a number of different ways to reach our support team, uh, like myself. There is by phone, by email, by live chat, and by our general ticket system through you know our contact us page. Uh, depending on where you are in the world, it's possible that we may not be able to respond immediately, but we also have heavily trained, highly capable channel partners as well um, who have been fully vetted on our products that can also give you a hand, especially if you've previously purchased your products through them. You can always reach out to them. Beyond our direct technical support team, we also have extensive and exhaustive uh, support documentation. So an online searchable user guide, a PDF version of the user guide, tons of blog posts and video content. Um, we have playlists on our YouTube page called EpiFanU that can kind of give you general steps and tips and walkthroughs how to configure all these different specific features. So there's no shortage of options and resources available if at some point, you know, either myself or another member of support team can't be immediately available to assist you. Um, thank you, Matt. Okay. That's comprehensive. So there's a lot of ways we reach people, which is great. I know it's not uh, quite the same for our European customers because of the time zone, but uh, we do our best. Um, if you have any more questions and you're watching this and you have questions about software encoding or hardware encoding or our Perl systems or anything else, Epifan or video related, please ask them now because uh, we're actually getting to the bottom of our list. So um, if we find that we're running out of questions, we will wrap this up. So now's your chance uh, if you want to say hi or ask us a question. Um, Matt's a pretty incredible tech support person for our team. So uh, it's a good opportunity. Um, and I think, Matt, you've done a pretty nice job of, of summarizing software versus hardware encoding. This is probably not your first uh, time explaining that concept, I'm going to guess. It's, it's not. I mean, uh, we have a lot of, of individuals who are you know, joining the video recording and streaming world uh, in 2020 because of current global conditions. Um, and it's always easiest to break down that there are two general, generally two major different categories for recording and streaming, and that's software and hardware. And so uh, today's webinar was mostly about outlining what are some of those key benefits, features, and limitations that you might run into. So um, we are very happy and thankful that you guys have been able to join us today for this webinar. Uh, and thank you so much for assisting and uh, answering polls and also asking questions with us. Yes, uh, we're here. We have a lot of other webinars lined up uh, over the next, uh, actually, we only have a couple published right now, but we have a, we're going to be discussing which webinars we're going to be doing next week. So uh, visit our website. Uh, there's a dedicated page on there called webinars, and you can see what's coming up next. And tune into our live show on Thursdays uh, on YouTube or Facebook, and mm -hmm. we'll have more video content just like this. So uh, thanks to everybody for watching today. Matt, thanks for uh, running this entire webinar while I was uh, sipping lattes with all oh, my internet down. My, my pleasure, George. I'm glad that those lattes were able to give you a little bit more energy. They did. They perked me right up. So thanks. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, guys. And until okay. next time. See you later.